Welcome everybody to the latest um, Fire Behaviour Analyst Network webinar. Um, today James is going to talk to us about Spark, which a few agencies are starting to try and use. Um, so I thought it would be a good idea for James to let everybody know what's going on. Um, you know, obviously it's up to your agency and jurisdiction how fast we, we either move or start running with two or three models, um, but it's certainly a, a very interesting space and it's it, it, it's a very different structured simulator to, to what people who use Phoenix are used to. So it's 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 useful for people to understand that I think. Um, so I with without saying too much, I think James will let you go and we potentially can have some, some discussions and discussions afterwards. Alright. Um, thanks for the intro Mike and Thanks for inviting me to talk and thanks to all those who have joined to listen in. So yeah, I'm here to talk today about Spark, which um, we're calling a wildfire modelling framework. So this really started life as an R&D project um, here in CSIRO to look at bushfire spread and sort of investigate new fire behaviour models. And um, it's a collaboration between two teams here. Um, we're a modelling team in Data61 and Andrew Sullivan's team in Land and Water. And Andrew's team have really been invaluable in um, giving us all the feedback about actual fire spread because we're actually specialists in computer modelling. So I guess since the start of development the system has really grown into a fully fledged software tool that some of you, as Mike mentioned, uh, might have seen or be using. And But really that tool was just a technology demonstrator but it's actually grown into a lot more than that and we're, we're hoping we can soon make the next step from this demonstrator into a, into a tool for operational use. So anyway, without further ado, today I'll be giving an overview of the framework and what it can be used for and hopefully I'll be running a couple of um, live demos showing the capabilities and uh, giving an overview of the way forwards. So that's our title slide. All right, so, so we're kind of looking at computer modelling of a bushfire and this really attempts to predict where the fire will go from a known set of ignitions and the kind of questions we'd like answered are you know, how fast can the fire spread, when will it arrive somewhere, how much damage could this fire cause? And the second question is, if we put in some measures to control this fire, what effect will they have? So the motivation for Spark was to try and answer these questions, but do so in a way that was open and, and also flexible. Now by open I mean you can see exactly what's going on when you run the model, and this is in case you ever need to audit it to, to find out exactly what you've run. And by flexible I mean that the fire behaviour models can easily be up, updated or changed if, if provably better models come along um, and that's without relying on us, the software developers, to provide a new version of the software. So once it's out there, people can, can update it and, and change it um, to agreed sort of standards. Um, it was also built to use new computer hardware which allows it to crunch more data and hopefully this, is, this will allow more complex and uh, far, complex fire behaviour models to be used if needed and it's also been designed to work with most common GIS systems for interoperability. And um, finally, it was actually designed to allow people to add new fire behaviour to the system. For example, new fire behaviour effects, which are currently being researched, could um, be added in the future if they're found to provide more accurate predictions. However, um, fire modelling is a very complicated business, as I'm, as I'm sure you're all aware. There's a lot you need to get right. So some of the requirements for the modelling are you need to actually model up the heat release and the rate of spread of the fire. Um, you need to account for things like terrain effects and also you need to account for multiple different fuel types. Each burn differently and have different characteristics. Um, you need to account for the wind and other weather information um, and you need to model how this interacts with the fire. Um, you might want to look at where the smoke goes. Now the fire itself, the fire actually um, self interacts by creating an indraw of air and it actually sort of from some of the stuff we've been looking at it looks like this could be important for a few things. So you might actually want to incorporate that into the model. Um, if you're looking at uh, sort of small scale effects, radiant heat flux might be important, especially urban, wildlo urban wildland interfaces to gauge exposure levels to structures. And one of the biggest difficulties actually in modelling is, is um, fire brands. So these get lift, lofted up by the turbulent column and carried downwind and they, they start spot fires at sort of unpredictable locations. So we're actually working on modelling all of the above in Spark with the current exception of smoke. Um, as this is a long range effect we, we actually think this is better, best left to the expertise of uh, meteorologists who um, specialise in this area. So Spark itself 
um, predicts the movement of the fire perimeter over time. And this is calculated from rates of spread for different fuels, which have been carefully calibrated by fire scientists, such as those in Andrew's team, to um, different weather conditions. So this takes a, so Spark actually takes a set of ignition conditions and weather data and models how the fire spreads based on this. And it can use many different fuel types, each with their own uh, rate of spread model. I won't go too much into the technical details, but the underlying method is grid-based and it's based on the distance from the fire perimeter. And this is actually a newer computer method and it has many advantages over older methods, including the ability to handle any number of fire lines merging, as well as precisely con control the speed of the fire perimeter. Um, Spark also contains a set of other auxiliary fire um, behavior models, including extinguishing, disruption handling, as well as fire feedback and train effects. And I'll talk about some of these um, a little later. Now, I think as Mike mentioned, um, it's, it's a slightly different take on, on, on the modeling system. So the core part of Spark can actually be wrapped up in a number of different ways. And some of you may be familiar with the GUI demonstrator, which runs as a point and click application to window with a map. And I'll be um, showing this a bit later. However, there's versions that actually are designed to run on the cloud or servers. And we've actually had, we actually have a whole family of other versions of Spark that are used for things like um, risk analytics, BAL assessments, and research and development. So in all of these models, though, um, the underlying kind of philosophy still holds. Uh, the fire behavior models are all fully configurable. So this includes the rate of spread of the fire, the movement of the movement of firebrands through the air, and how disruptions are handled. And these are actually entered as text scripts into the system, such as this script for the CSIRO grassland model. So if you open your, your handy fire um, spread book, you can find an equation, and you can translate that into a Spark script. Um, so we can provide these scripts, other people can come up with them, people can send them around and test them, but most of the time these won't actually need to be edited once you've got a kind of working working version or, or even looked at. But uh, as I was saying, a key part of the Spark system is seeing exactly what model you've used if required um, in case you need to check or audit um, what you've got. Likewise, um, the input data can be a variety of types, and we've configured Spark for a range of um, these data types. Generally, the weather can be, say, a time series from, for example, a spot forecast, or maybe um, a gridded product, such as the, the, grim, uh, the gridded bomb uh, forecast. Um, likewise, Spark can be used with any number of spatial layers for the various fuel models. Um, these can be any format or resolution, and Spark will handle all the conversion. Um, so in this example here, for example, you've got um, two different uh, models. You've got a, a forest model, which requires elevation and fuel load, and you've got a grassland one that requires elevation and curing. Um, but you can actually have any, any number of these layers in there, any number of combinations, any number of um, models. Um, but as with the fire models, once you've set this up, you don't need to go back and configure this. It just allows that to be um, allows it to be configured and extended as needed, and for the fire models and input layers to change as they get updated. All right, now I'm just going to jump over to the demo, and please bear with me. So this demo will be for our current demonstration ver version of Spark, and some of the um, options and details aren't actually locked down yet. Um, and an operational tool may have sort of some additional features, basically based on what you need. Um, right. So can everyone see something? Uh, yep, I can, James. So you can see a nice friendly map of Australia. Good yep. stuff. Uh, some people might need to resize their screens to get it full. It's just a matter of juggling to get it uh, to get a full presentation. Okay. Um, so when you start it up, it loads this nice friendly map of Australia. So I'll just load in a project. So what you can see on the map is you can see um, ignition locations. And for this example, it's just a single point ignition. And if you want, you can actually display operational assets on this. Um, and this is a, burn, a previously burnt area, which is showed as this stripy box. So to run the thing, you just press start. And it will chug away, and then um, then by default it will just come up with this color-coded map of arrival time and isochrones here. Um, so in this, for example, the color scale here is representing the arrival time. So blue shows where the fire has been from zero to one hours, and red is eight to nine hours. So you can get a quick visual representation of where the fire is going to go. 
Um, you can also use this time slider at the bottom to interactively move to a point in time and see what the fire perimeter is doing. So I'll just turn off the arrival time. So if you move about on this, you can actually get a get a view of where the fire is at that particular time. Turn off the isochrones. Um, this perimeter will also show um, what the wind was recorded at that particular point in time at that fire perimeter. Again, this can be changed based on user feedback. Um, this is just for the demo. Um, the other thing you can do is you can actually play this over time and let the fire kind of progress. Um, so you can get an idea of where the fire is going. You can just play it in a loop. Um, anyway, I'll just stop that. Go back to the beginning. So there's actually a, a range of different um, layers that uh, the thing comes out with. So I'll just turn off the, uh, just turn on this one, which is actually the outputs. You can change something like the fire line intensity. It's showing it there. Might just tone it down a bit. You can do things like turn on the train. And if you go in and zoom in, you can actually see that the uh, the high bits of intensity are actually on the uh, run up of hills, which is what you'd expect, which is all very nice. So you can actually get a good good sort of sense out of this and pull pull some analytics out if you need to. To get more details, you can actually use some of these tools. So there's this ink dropper tool here. You can run over the, the map and it will tell you exactly, well, it'll tell you values from the layers that are turned on at that point. So it will tell you the fire intensity and also the land elevation. But, um, and there's a range of these tools here, including selection. You can measure length on the thing. I oh, know, I'm sorry, the text is quite small on this. Um, the you can also start new fires by simply just clicking on the map. It accepts point inputs, line inputs, and you should just press start and it should chug away and run from those new ignitions. So once it's set up, you can very quickly just put new bits and pieces into it. You can, you can add new ignition conditions. Um, you can change the location of the, the points and things like that. Um, I'll just jump over to um, the second demo. So this is something that was actually developed by Sam Ferguson in Tassie, and I hope he doesn't mind me showing it here. So for the rest of these demos, I'm not going to run the thing again. Um, I'm just going to show you the data. So it's just loaded up the data that's already been um, run. So Sam set this up to actually look at uh, fuel reduction strategies around Tasmania. So the stripy area here is actually an area that's um, been treated, I think. And so you can see the fire runs into it and actually slows down at this point. But I want to show you this example because it's actually got um, a very complicated land classification, which I think is based on TASVEG. Um, and there's actually um, a whole bunch of different fuel types here, including eucalypt, button grass, heathland, and grassland. So a spark runs over the grid, whichever cell it gets into, it picks out that rate of spread model and uses that to calculate the progression of the fire. Um, and that's what it's doing here. And if you use the ink dropper tool and mouse over, you can actually see up in the top left-hand corner all the different land classifications and what it's, what it's been using. Um, now this example too, he actually used um, gridded weather. So I'll turn that on. Oh, it's a bit big. Turn off the isochrones. If you press go, um, Spark will actually show you what the weather, what the weather um, vectors are doing at, that po at each point. So these arrows here are showing the wind direction and strength um, at each of the gridded weather locations. And to calculate the fire, Spark will actually interpolate between these and use that as the um, input condition for the, uh, for the fire spread. So again, you can, you can pull all this sort of analytics out, the, um, out of the simulation if you want and have a look at exactly at a particular point what the wind was doing, where the fire was, and all those kind of good things. Um, Spark can be used for very large simulations. So this is um, the Wongri fire. So this runs um, in under a minute on this laptop, but I won't show you because we'll be sitting around in silence for a minute. Um, and again, you can toggle through these various layers to look at um, all the all the different kind of um, things that all the different analytics in the simulation. This fire has uh, four ignition points, all of which are timed at different intervals because these fires broke out at different points. 
Um, a good example of this is actually something we've recently been doing with, with Western Australia. And what this is, is a prescribed burn that got out. So each of these orange parts here are an aerial, an aerial ignition or an aerial ignition. And these all happened at different times. Um, so if you switch over to the configuration tab, you can actually get a list of all the, all the ignition points and the time at which that ignition was carried out. Um, it also loads in any data that happened to be in the, the shapefile that was used for the ignitions. So um, there's a description here of exactly what happened. <coughs> um, I haven't switched over the configuration tab before, but um, here you, you have an output showing all the, uh, the ignition conditions. And above it, you have some basic um, settings for the simulation. So um, in this, you've got a project name, a start time, which you can just pick from a, from a dialog box, an end time, um, or how long the simulation runs for, the resolution of the simulation, so this is running at 15 meter resolution, um, the projection, and on the right hand side you just have the output settings, which are <coughs> basically for this a bunch of um, GeoTIFF files and shape files. If you want, you can actually write to a to KML file and then you can import that into Google Earth and look at it on a 3D map. Just moving on to um, a new example. So Spark actually um, has a spot fire model, and this example shows spot fires created downwind of a fire, and you can see it actually jumps over the cleared area here. So um, you can actually look at where the spots were. That's actually pretty small. And they're color coded by the time those spots actually um, started. Now this actually uses a fairly uh, basic example where the spot fires are, ba are created based on a maximum distance. And we're developing, well, the Spark has a capability to actually model the path of firebrands through the air, so much more complicated models, and we're actually working on that now with a number of research partners. Um, and that will, and you can actually have the firebrand transport, landing, and ignition all as scripts within Spark. So within the system, I could send you a script that would actually, would actually do all that. Um, one other example here. So this demo is just showing as well some uh, disruptions. So what you can do is you can actually read in a, a road network, and this is actually the road network for the whole of Victoria you can read in. Out of that network, it, it actually extracts the road width. And then we have a model in there that actually gives the chance of the fire jumping that road based on the road width. And um, if you watch this one go, you can actually see it hits the roads. I'll slow it down a bit. So it comes along, gets held up by the road for a little bit, and then it breaches at this point here and goes just goes straight over these ones because I think these roads are a, um, a bit narrower. And the final thing I really want to show is um, is um, ensemble modeling. Now this is sort of one of the major features of the Spark, and this is um, the ability to carry out multiple simulations and combine the results in, in such a way as to give you something like a probability of where the fire will be um, at the end point, rather than saying, oh, here's the fire perimeter at the end point. So this example here is actually, um, there's, I think there's five fires starting. I'm afraid it only shows the first one in, in the demo. That's just a little bug. Um, what it's done is it's actually started the fires at different locations. And then it's combined the results together to give this heat map. So red is 100% chance. So all of the simulations agree that the fire will arrive at that point. And then blue is like low chance. So only some of the fires agree at that point. And setting this thing up is very, very easy. But rather than running uh, a single um, simulation, it just counts down here as to the number of simulations it's, it's doing. Um, so when it's done all five, it'll just display the results again. Um, all right, and so yeah, this can be used to take in uncertainty and things into account, and I think this is fits in very well with stuff that um, QFAS are currently doing with with Saber and, and Ben's approach to this. Um, so that's a conversation that we definitely want to have with them at some point. All right. Well, I think that's the live demo bit done. So I'll just switch back to the um, slides. 
Now I actually put this in in case the live demo didn't work. So I'll just quickly flick through all this. So I was hoping just for the final part of the presentation, I'd, I'd sort of talk a bit about some of the research we're doing and sort of how this will fit into future plans, plans with Spark. So as I showed there, one of the sort of major things we can do is actually run through a whole set of simulations and composite the results um, in Spark. And this is something we've been looking at actually to, to do a lot of risk analysis with. So um, this screenshot here, um, which looks like a complete mess, um, actually shows for a given re for a given start point, um, the probability of a fire line intensity being between some values. Um, I actually had to remove the backing map because someone recognised it, and we shouldn't actually share results um, um, in case someone sees their house and thinks thinks they're at risk. Um, so sorry, you can't really get a sense of scale. Um, but this is actually run through 200 different weather scenarios that are picked out for different FFDI, FFDI categories. Um, and it's composited all the results together to actually kind of give this, this, this probability heat map. And um, this, is, this can be done for like large regions. For example, this is, this is a, a Sydney Trains project. And we've actually done it at every single power point down, down the trains, train lines. And out of that, you can pull out these risk maps um, and from that, you can actually calculate further metrics like the damage costs and, and likelihood of um, fire arriving at certain points. Um, another area of interest that we're looking at is actually very short, small-scale fires. Um, and, and Spark can scale from, from large-scale, you know, 100-meter grid cells all the way down to 1-meter grid cells. Uh, or, or even below, I think we've run fires in the examples in the Pyrotron and stuff, which are centimeter scales. Um, but what we're interested in with this is, is there's a kind of um, movement towards maybe um, looking at radiant heat flux models and sort of stepping one step beyond the current bowel models and actually getting um, dynamic uh, flames in there um, and radiant heat flux to look at exposure on, on structures. So this is something we've actually been working on here with Justin Leonard and his team. And um, there's actually a radiant heat flux model we've developed for this. and um, the screenshot on the um, right-hand side actually shows uh, a fire using the, I think it's just the MacArthur model with flame tilt. And these two spheres here are actually colored by the radiant heat flux from that fire at that particular point in time. And you can see the, this one on the, uh, the one sort of in the L shape is, is completely blue because it's shielded by that wall, whereas the one in the path of the fire obviously has a much greater heat flux. Um, so you can actually combine the spark modeling system with this radiant heat flux modeling system and get these 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 very um, accurate sort of time series of intensity radiation uh, profiles out for, for locations uh, in your scenario. Um, the difficulty with this stuff is you've actually got to um, t kind of take into account uh, ground slope, intervening vegetation and things like that. And the difficulty with that is not actually the modeling, but it's actually getting getting the data. So we're actually working with a couple of teams at the moment, and the idea being to pull in some um, LIDAR maps and use that to give us uh, de density, which can be used to attenuate the, the um, radiant heat flux. Um, and really, um, I think remote, the remote sense data in general has a, has a massive potential um, in, this, in this area, especially for things like looking at, looking at fuel states. Um, this is um, another sort of research direction that we're looking at where we're trying to pull in um, remote sense data and use that to directly populate uh, input layers in Spark. This is actually the, the plots from the Project Vesta experiment showing um, pre and post fire conditions. And you can actually see the individual plots that are burnt um, on these remote sense maps. And um, these can be converted into an actual fuel age. So um, you can actually automate the whole process going from remote sense data acquisition all the way to input fuel layers within the system. Um, another area of interest is we're actually looking at integration with atmospheric models. And the, the reason we're doing this is we want to look at two things. We want to look at sensitivity to um, weather conditions. So we want to say, you know, what are the, the greatest um, effects on a fire? Is it is it wind gusts? Is it wind strength? 
Um, but also for some historical events, we'd really like to get the hindcasts of these things. So we're using the in-house siren model called CCAM to, to do this with. And um, we're doing this for a few historical events. The, the idea being to actually um, uh, to actually go back and validate what our results are against um, the best, or well, uh, to, against the best possible weather scenarios we can pull out from CCAM. And finally, I just want to show you this because this is the part I'm actually uh, sort of most excited about. And this is the stuff that we're actually doing as part of the CRPC project. And um, we're working very closely with Jason Sharples and his team in this. And this is kind of, um, we call this kind of near field effects. And this is all about um, fire line attraction and why fires become a certain shape and how they're affected by, by terrain and wind. So the pictures here show some experimental fires carried out um, by Andrew and his team. Um, and these are 33 or 30 meter, what, 30 meter grass plots. And they've been lit from these corners by two drip torches walking inwards. And after a while, you get this kind of V shape. And as the fire progresses, it actually kind of pops out in this, into this parabola. But you'll notice that the fire actually attracts, attracts together. And what we found is this is actually caused by a, a pressure effect. <clears throat> so when you have a fire burning, it generates a plume of hot gas. And this creates this low pressure front that actually um, causes indraw into a fire. But this one, this one effect actually explains a whole bunch of things that have been observed in fires. Um, so by adding a fire perimeter model that marches along, plus the kind of local area effect caused by this, this, this pressure field, you can actually do things like um, recreate these parabolic shapes. You can actually get spot fires that coalesce together um, uh, and actually attract towards each other. Um, not only that, but out of the same model, you can actually pull, you can actually correct for terrain um, in a similar method to Wind Ninja without any additional processing. And, and I think this is really the place we're going to go next. And Jason has called it an intermediate complexity model. And this is kind of the step beyond these, these, um, these basic models which just march your fire perimeter forward. So it's like a fire perimeter marching forward plus a bit of extra physics to account for the pressure fields near the fire. Um, so for example, here's um, a fire in the Pyrotron. And here's the spark simulation shown as the black line on the, sorry, you can't see my mouse. This is on the right hand side. And you can see it pretty much recreates that parabolic shape. On the left hand side is the same model, but this is compared to wind measurements over a hill um, on, a, on, a, on a hill a couple of kilometers big, I think, um, compared to a correction, uh, compared to wind generated by this pressure inflow from the from the same model, um, so you so you get the rounding effects and the fire line traction effects plus all the train correction for free by just using this 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 one model. Um, and the very last thing I want to show on the same thing is we're looking at the same thing now for um, there's a, there's a similar effect which is actually to do with the the air circulation. Um, so when these fires generate this plume of hot gas, they actually create this um, air circulation near the fire as well. And on the lee slope of hills, this is very important because you get this kind of um, uh, lateral spreading effect that I think Jason has talked to some of you about before. And we can actually recreate this in Spark very, very easily by just adding this additional vortex, um, or sorry, circulation, I should say, field to the, to the model. And I think that um, this kind of, like I was saying, this kind of perimeter plus these extra bits um, are really the direction um, that we're looking to go in the future with these models, because you can you can pull you can pull out all this ex additional fire behaviour for um, that come out of these sort of reasonably simple models. Um, anyway, that's probably it from me. Just in summary, so Spark is this, this sort of flexible new wildfire modelling platform, and it was designed to integrate with these existing systems and GIS capability. And most importantly, it kind of allows this straightforward deployment of new fire behavior models. And by that, I mean uh, rate of spread models, firebrand transport models, and also these more complex behaviors that I've just shown with fire line attraction, uh, parabolic rounding, and all these kind of lateral spread effects. And 
as well as the core of the system, you know, we've developed this whole range of visualization options and analysis tools that we've kind of put together in that in the demonstrator that many of you have been using. Um, we've also got this kind of in, uh, integrated ensemble capability for uncertainty analysis and risk assessment that we'd like to kind of look at going forwards with some people who've, who've done similar things. So, sort of the, the the future developments of this is this this demonstrator is is um, it's just a current, well, currently it's just a demonstration version, and we're kind of in discussion, and we want this to be an open discussion with everyone for actually building maybe an operational version of this that people can use, or maybe tuning that version to um, to to specific needs um, for for F bands and other operational users. And finally, you know, um, we'd like Spark to be sort of research and development test bed for these new fire behavior models, and. Um, that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thanks, <coughs> thanks, James. Um, has anyone got any questions for James? G'day, James. Ben from Queensland. How you going? Oh, hey, Ben. Um, you're on tumbling stuff. Funnily yep. enough, <laughs> can you show us some of the GUI components that let you define those distributions and? Um, how you're actually going about setting what those distributions look like when they're applied through the time series for both weather and fuels. I can show you this one. It is very, very simple. It is definitely not as complex as your stuff. So I haven't pressed the advanced button on this before. It gives you a warning and then all this stuff pops up. Um, so in this, I just have a script that basically takes a point and then um, assigns uh, and then picks from a Gaussian distribution around that point as to where the fire is for this particular example. Um, I don't think I've got I don't think I've got an example with wind direction, but if you have a, a just a, if you have a script that actually um, provides that distribution or you have some sort of set of distributions you want to read in from a file, you can just impose it in this. But again, it's not like we don't provide a method to to actually create that distribution. It's up to the end user of how they want to configure it. And by end user, I mean what you're doing, Ben. Yeah, OK, no worries. I, um yeah, it's just that um, there's there's a lot of complexity in how you define those uncertainty distributions for all your different inputs through time, um, and it, yes, Spark can absolutely do that if you can write all the code to do it. Um, it's just not going to be straightforward for people. That's all. Yep, and I mean it's it's so where we sit, it, like I was saying, we're the modeling team. So what we're trying to provide is a platform for people to implement models on. So like, I mean, I would never dream of writing a fire behavior model because that's, say, what Andrew and his team do, or that's what other experts do. And in the same way, I'd never, like I'd never put in a distribution model because that's your area of expertise. I mean, but the ability to do that is what I'm interested in providing to people. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, I appreciate really, it. I think it's, I think it's really good. I, I'm, yeah. I'm really, really happy with the framework. I think it's great. Has anyone else got a question? You've stunned them, James. It must be lunchtime. <laughs> well, well, perhaps maybe I could just chime in at, at another point. It's Jason Sharples here. If I could just add another uh, comment on top of the uh, ensemble discussion there. Um, a lot of the work we're starting to do now in our group is looking at incorporating uncertainty into fire spread models as an intrinsic component. So what I mean there is the way things have been done is to sort of set all the, the randomness up at the start and then run a deterministic simulator. We've actually been looking at incorporating that uncertainty into, into the simulator as an intrinsic component. And in doing that, looking at something like the level set formulation which underpins Spark uh, provides a lot more natural way to be able to do that. 
that's all I got. Jason, are you hiding on the online list? I, I couldn't I couldn't get the uh, slides to come up. My my flash player was out of date. <laughs> right. Okay. But I was listening. Hello, it's Alice from Victoria. I'm with, uh, wondering if you could just provide a bit more information about the spotting um, element. Um, yeah, sure. So what's the current, the, the demo I just showed uh, basically has a maximum um, spotting distribution. She, Matt Plachinski might be able to give a bit more <laughs> background on that because he actually, him and Will actually implemented it. Um, I'm not too sure what model it used, but um, the demo I showed basically just teleports uh, a sort of a spot to a to a to a distribution around the maximum um, for that particular fuel type. Um, were you interested in the, the sort of capabilities or that the particular model that I showed? Model and capabilities. Please. Yeah, so that so that's what that that model does, but. Um, but uh, within Spark, it's actually got the ability to to um, to create um, firebrands, and it's got scripts to actually transport those through the air, and it's got scripts that actually describe the, the probability of them land um, igniting when they land. And the idea is that that's a kind of placeholder for future science. And and again, we, what we're trying to do is is develop a platform in which. Um, Experts in that can actually develop these spot, these firebrand transport and ignition models, and much like the fire behaviour and rate of spread, um, they can be programmed in using scripts. So Spark can ab abstract away all the complexity of, you know, working out the paths of these things and integrating it with the fire behaviour and stuff. They can just concentrate on that on that part. Um, there's there's probably not that much research out there that's that's directly able to be translated yet but we're we're trying to talk to people about that and and see what they they'd need to put it uh, to implement it in in such a system thank you yeah no problem Hi, Erin uh, Heinrich here from the RFS. Um, just wondering um, what sort of output comes out of the Ensemble products um, in relation to, you know, um, how, how many ignitions can you put in and what, what comes out the other end? Um, again, it's kind of, you can, you, you can actually, I know I've said this about 50 times, but there's a script that you can put in that actually gives you the outputs and how you combine them. Um, in the example I showed, um, it's um, just a probability of the fire arriving at a certain cell. Um, you can have things like um, the minimum arrival time from the ensembles. Um, in the example, I actually, in the, in the screenshot I showed for the Sydney Trains project, it actually outputs um, histograms categorized into bands. So um, I can't remember what it was, like zero to 10,000, 10,000 to 20,000 in, 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 different, in different bands. And that was the, the probability of a fire intensity um, being above that. So um, I mean, it's, it depends what you need. So it can be configured for the use case that you need rather than having to use the outputs um, as is, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Yep. One of the things James mentioned was there's <clears throat> work to shift the demonstrate demonstration model into a operational model and that's one that perhaps has less complexity, um, you know, less things you can tweak. Um, and one of the things we're probably looking we are looking for is some feedback from 
the sorts of things that people want to be able to manage and, and things that don't. So it's a, you, know, so you get Phoenix and, and there's a limited number of things you can actually manipulate <coughs> other than the, the raw inputs. And so that's, uh, that's one of the projects that uh, James is obviously, we're just, uh, very, a range of people are in discussion with James and, and uh, the team at Data61 to try and work out what that looks like what are the sort of capabilities an operational F-band wants so that you don't have too much to do in the rush, but at the same time gives you enough flexibility to produce a decent forecast uh, prediction. So if people have thoughts or ideas about some of the things that James has shown or some of the things that you might like to see, uh, that's certainly something that um, the particular services group are looking for. So by all means, either talk to your group or you can easily talk to me <coughs> um, about about that sort of stuff. Because that was certainly that's where we're driving to is to get Spark, get an operational version of it that's relatively sim simple to use, but still has some of the advantages that Spark can offer. And there'll still be a a research version if you like that that you can do much more things with. But they're the sort of things that you've got to have the time, space, and headspace to do it. I think that's about where we're at. Is that right, James? Yeah, no, that's right. And um, yeah, by all means, like like you, I think you were saying at the beginning, we'd like to be seen as turning it on its head. So rather than saying, "Here's the product that does this," you tell us what you want the product to do, and we can configure it that, or, or someone else can configure it that way to provide useful data to you. Um, that's what we're kind of aiming for with the system. Um, and yeah, certainly with the operational version, we are looking at a much, much cut down uh, model with, with all the stuff. So I mean, yeah, operationally, you're not going to go in and start changing file models and, and changing the, the you know, file brand distributions and stuff like that. You, you just want something that you, you probably want to just point and click and press go and it loads in the latest data and you, you know you can rely on it and you know it's, it's, it's there. And that's certainly something that we're, we're very keen to um, work together on. And yeah, we're having a lot of discussion around that. But if you have ideas from what you've seen today on that, please let 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 us know. If there are, are there one last call for questions or comments. If there aren't, if there aren't, I'd certainly like to thank James for his uh, time and presentation today. It's um, this is. It's um, it's great to see developers and, and researchers exposing their their sort of almost done products rather than waiting to the end. Uh, and yeah, I certainly would encourage you if you've got feedback or have a think about it. Doesn't matter whether you're using it or not. It's it's you know conceptually the ideas are there. This is just a, this is another another tool that potentially will be available for people down the track. We just want to try and make it to the point where it's actually more useful than something else or does something different so that you, you might, you know, you've got different tools for different purposes. Certainly the big attraction for those that are using it is it has, it has the capability of using models that aren't currently, you know, they're not your standard forest and, and grass models which, which for those that have lots of those fuel types that's, that's certainly an attraction of Spark because it, it, it deals with, with spaces that we can't deal with with the current models. Uh, so thanks James. Um, and just before I go, we go. I need to. What do I need to do? The the just a quick ad for what's gone now. Uh, there's an, another webinar occurring on the twenty. Is it the twenty sixth? 24th of October, uh, Miguel Cruz is going to present on predicting fires in Mallee Heath. Um, a flyer will come out about that hopefully later this week. Um, that's a bit out of sequence, but um, this has been arranged for Miguel to talk to some people and we thought we'd piggyback on the back of that. Um, and then there'll be another one in early December where I'm hoping either Tory or um, someone else from the Bureau will be able to talk about their, their, the lightning prediction work that they've been working on recently. Um, again, if you have any ideas for 
things that you want to hear more about or speakers that you want to hear, please let me know. Other than that, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, and everyone. I hope to hear or see you at the next webinar.